One of the questions, I went to a conference this week uh, down in Walsall and one of the questions somebody posed was, have you ever wondered what Adam and Eve spoke to God about? And what God spoke to them about? Which is a curious thing that we, we can't say what they didn't do, but God never told them to go and evangelize, did he? He didn't go, go find some sick and pray for them. He didn't say, you know, go off on your trials, I'll, I'll lead you to foreign countries, because there weren't anybody. He didn't, he didn't say, go visit grandma, because grandma didn't exist. The only thing they must have talked about is how awesome creation was and how awesome God was. And that's a picture of prayer, isn't it? Communion with God. Praying with God. And I often say that, you know, we need to spend time with God and God will tell us where he's leading us in life. Often people say to me, Johnny, I don't know what God's got for me. I don't know where he's leading me. I don't know what's going on. But ultimately, God's not really that. He will get to that, but he often wants to just spend some time with you. Just with you. So have you ever wondered what God's will is for your life? There's several layers of God's will for your life, but at the end of the day, number one God's will for your life is that you spend time with him. Because we're going to spend time with him forever. He wants to get to know you before you go. We don't have arranged marriages with Jesus. He likes to get to know you first. Well, he knows all about you, but he wants you to get to know him first. It's not like suddenly you turn up and it's like there's a, I hope it's the one on the left that I'm getting married to and not the one on the right sort of thing. It's a case of, have you ever wondered really what God's will is for your life? Well, in Romans 12 verse 1, that's what we started on last week and we're going to get to the point where we, we understand God's will. But it says this, and I'll, I'll read, I'll echo last week and then move on. But verse 1 and 2, it says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2 says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. So if we don't know what God's will is for our life, it kind of gives a, an in here that if we want to know, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. If you don't know what God's will is, then you need to step up a part of the verse and re read what it says, because you do what it says above, and then you can test and, you're able to test and approve what God's will is. Well, the little bit above says, do not conform to a pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, to know what God's will is, not just verse two, but it's verse one as well. Verse one talks about laying our bodies down as living sacrifice, and we looked at that last week, holy and pleasing to God. That's the first step in knowing God's will for your life. Now, I, I've struggled with people who seem to aimlessly grow through life. Now, I understand for Christians, non-Christians should say, because they have no hope, they have no sense of future. If their all existence is, I exist for today, and tomorrow I die and I become worm food, I understand why they're crazy, and do all the things that, that gives them the pleasure that they need now, because they won't have eternity. Well, they will, but not where we're going. So, but for us as Christians, God wants us to walk in his will. And some people over the years, I've heard preachers say amazing things and some would say downright rubbish when it comes to the will of God because some people overcomplicate the will of God. So we're going to look at walking into the will of God, but it starts off with laying our bodies as living sacrifices because this is holy and pleasing to God. And this is our proper worship, our true sense of worship. So the first part of finding God's will is to give your life as a living sacrament, make Jesus your Lord, and worship him by your life. You know, if you're worshipping God by your everyday life, you're unlikely to step into the dark places around you. If you're worshipping Jesus and being thankful to God, you're unlikely to do things that are dishonouring to God or sinful, aren't you? Because you're focused on Jesus. So you lay your bodies down as living sacrifices, as holy and pleasing to God. This is your true act of worship. And then you're worshipping him. Then it continues. It's not, a, even though it's a separate verse, it's still the same statement. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't be squeezed into this mold. You know, from the moment you 
realise that you're part of his humanity, whether that's as a two-year-old, a three-year-old, or whatever, once you get to that point where, especially nowadays, because we have to be careful what our kids watch on telly, because most of us still, I'm talking about kids TV, in fact I'm talking about um, the ones for the littlies, because there was some stuff in there which were okay, and some stuff in there which were downright dodgy. And we knew that by watching, but we're not letting his kids watch this. Um, I'd rather them watch Tom and Jerry, which is just brutal <laughs> nowadays <laughs> compared to what we grew up on. But from an early age, we are being pressured to conform to this pattern of this world. We all want to be different, but in reality, we don't want to be too different, so we don't stick out too much. So we actually do conform. And through school and high school, we've been pressured to conform into the workplace, pressured to conform that the Bible says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't give in to the pattern of this world. In 1 Peter 1.14, we read this, as obedient children, do not conform, uh, conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Don't go back to where you used to live. Don't conform to that way of living, but live a life that's honouring to God. James 4, 4 onwards, it says, this is quite interesting to James, he doesn't pull his punches, he says, you adulterous people. He's talking to Christians. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means en with against God or being an enemy of God? If you're a friend of the world, now that don't mean or well, can't have friends in the world. It's not talking about that. It's talking about if you take on the world's identity, if you take on the things of the world and you've got... Do you stand out a little bit as a Christian or do you just fit nicely into that beige area of life? And he said, don't you know that friendship with the world means you're an enemy of God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Hang on a minute. He's not talking about friendship with people. However, if there are people that lead you into sin, stay away from them. If you've got friends that pull you into dark places, stay away from them. But he says if you, you know, if you choose, so the choice is yours to be a friend, that means you can choose not to be a friend of the world. That doesn't mean we're awful, it doesn't mean we're unkind, it doesn't mean that we're just obnoxious. It means we don't have to compromise and just do the things that the world does which is really awkward when you pull into a 30 zone and everybody's doing 50 past you. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but don't conform to a part of this world. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of this world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you not know what the Bible says without reason that the, the jealous that, uh, let's read this, without reason that the E, God, is jealous and longs for the spirit that he has caused to dwell in you. Because when you walk into an area, when your friends lead you into sin, when you're doing something that's hurtful and harmful to you or to other people, the Holy Spirit's with you. You don't take a two-year-old into certain places. You don't take a five-year-old to watch 18 films. There's a reason why we even as people understand, why the world even understands that. And yet we as Christians can be in danger of taking the Holy Spirit into place. Now we know God's everywhere, he knows what's going on. But in the sense of this verse, we've got to be careful that we don't take the Holy Spirit. Because he says, for he says with reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit that is caused to dwell in us. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. But he gives us more grace as the scripture says. I can't give in to this. I can't, I can't resist it. God says, I'll give you some more grace. I can't help it, I'll give you some more grace. In other words, you've still got a choice and you can help it with Jesus because the Holy Spirit inside you is telling you, guys, let's be honest, when you step into doing something that you know is not right, you know it's not right. You know, you know when you've compromised, you know when you've out and out sinned, you know when you've just fallen short, whichever terms you want to put in there. You know, but God says, I will give you more grace. Why? Because the Bible says this, God opposes the proud but gives favour or grace to the humble. Proud means I'll do it my way. I had a good friend and uh, he'd been delivered from um, drug addiction and uh, he started taking drugs again. I said, what are you playing at? You know that this is only going in one direction. He said, I'll be all right. He says, because God's delivered me once, he'll do it again. I went, you're on a dangerous ground, very dangerous ground because God showed you grace, but now you're getting into pride. and it's, God opposes the proud, 
but gives favour to humble. But the verb carries on. Verse 7, we're still in James 4. Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We looked at that last week. You need to submit first, then you resist the devil, then he flees from you. And then he said this, come near to God. So again, he's talking to believers, come near to God and he will draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Key phrase there, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. And it's not talking about doing that in a, in a, a normal setting, but because you're double-minded, because you've not walked with God, because you're not walking close to God, because of the sin and impurity that's in your heart, he says, mourn, grieve, wail. Take it seriously. Change your laughter into mourning, your joy into gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Which is good things because he doesn't say just do that and then be miserable. He says do those things and he humble yourself and he will lift you up. James 1 verse 7 to 8 says this. The person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. He's talking about somebody who prays and is asking God for something and not doing it with belief but doing it in doubt. He says such a person is double minded and unstable in all that they do. If we are compromised and if we are conforming to the pattern of this world, the Bible says we're double-minded and we're unstable. Why do we look like we're crazy? Maybe because we're double-minded. Why is everybody not understanding us? Maybe because we're double-minded. Maybe God's plan and purpose is what we've got out of to follow our own ambitions and God's saying, no, I want you to follow mine. So we need to choose not to be friends of the world, not to compromise, not to conform, to the pattern of this world. Don't let it squeeze you. And it's easy. We've all been there. We've all got a situation where everybody, his friends in particular, oh, come on, it'll be right. It'll be right. It'll be right. I had to make decisions as a young Christian not to do things that were okay, but I knew it wasn't okay for me. It wasn't wrong. It just would have been wrong for me to do it. You see, 1 John 2 verse 16 says this, everything in the world, everything in the world, the lusts, of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life uh, come not from the Father, but from the world. If there's anything you're lusting after, it's called the world. It's the lust of the flesh, the, what we see, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Have you ever noticed that God uses our ears? The devil uses our eyes. It's what we see, but God whispers into our hearts. He uses our ears. It doesn't show us he talks yet the world offers us some if you read about Adam and Eve it talks about that Eve saw the fruit she looked if you look at David with Bathsheba he says he looked and saw when you see people in the Bible who sinned and, and basically trashed up the life it says they saw they looked they were peering see there's nothing wrong with having a look at something as in when you look past it's that second look and that stare that's the problem we used to drive around with a friend of mine called Steve. We used to drive all the places, scaffolders. We'd be over, and sometimes I had to rebuke him sometimes, and sometimes he'd slap me back um, because he'd say, Stop staring at that girl. And he says, It's not the first look that's a problem, it's the second look you say to me. So I'm making the first look long. I said, That's just as bad. But then he cocked me because I've been looking at somebody as well. So this is way before we got married and stuff like that. Now I've got a wife and she'll give me a black eye if I do. So, but in most days I just had the maid to kind of rebuke me. But the tr fact is that often we use our eyes. We're attracted by our eyes. It's what we see and we're drawn into. So be careful. The world is talking all the time to us. Adverts on the telly is what you're seeing. And believe it or not, you believe the lies that are given on most adverts. Why? Because they're not actually interested in whether your house is clean or not. They're only interested in selling you a product. They're not interested if you've got a wardrobe full of the latest designs, you need more. Why? Because you deserve it. You know, shampoo is shampoo. If it smells of apples, pears or not, it's shampoo. But the better stuff, the more expensive stuff, which has the same ingredients as the cheap stuff, well, we've got our back because it's better for us. Because we believe the lies. We're conforming to the pattern of this world. Do you know the Tenth Commandment says, do not covet? Covet? Covet. Which means, do not long for and lust after. Yet the adverts violate that command. Every time you watch them or listen to them on radio, violate it all the time. Because they're advertising stuff, A, you don't need, probably don't want, but when you see it, you do. It's a dangerous thing to watch QVC intake or other shopping channels. Because you didn't know you needed that sandwich maker, you've never had one. You don't really need one, but when you see it, you've got to have one. 
Why? Because it just sits on the side and collects dust. How many people have got those own bikes? Pedal at home. Don't have to go anywhere. The runners that you buy and you hang your washing on to dry. Because we believed the adverts. We were taken in by what we saw. We compromised. We actually were conforming to the pattern of this world. It's not saying we shouldn't excise. If you're going to buy them, at least use them. Or shun them back on eBay. But we need to not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mouths, minds. To be transformed actually takes time. It takes time. Like the hungry caterpillar. They always pick on a caterpillar, don't they? I'll get to the hungry caterpillar in a minute. But they never talk about the, the moth, metamorphic, mo metamorphosis, yeah. growing into a moth, the caterpillar growing into a moth, because they're ugly. But we always talk about the butterfly, don't we? But the butter, the, the caterpillar, it goes across, has the DNA in it to become a beautiful butterfly or a moth. Or there's loads of other actually insects that do similar sorts of things. When we become Christians, God's given us the ability inside to be transformed. But we need it. It takes time. It takes energy. It doesn't happen overnight. Now, one day, when you get saved, that's instant. You, you're walking away from God. You give your life over to God. You're saved. Ding! That's it. But your mind now needs renewing, transforming. Your spirit is alive to God, but your mind needs time to catch up. And one day, guess what? Our bodies will get an instant transformation, either from the grave or the rapture. One way or other, we'll get a physical transformation. But until then, our mind needs renewing. It needs to be transformed, but it takes time. It takes energy. It takes effort. If you've ever studied anything, we're not in the matrix, you know, even that's a subject for another time, but we're not in the matrix film where we can just plug something back and then download it all into us and we can do whatever. No, it takes time. The reason why some of our, our um, young people have gone off to universities to study, to, it takes time. You can't just do it overnight. No matter how many times you watch YouTube clips on brain surgery, it doesn't mean you can do it. Now, changing your tyres, maybe, or your wheels, fine. You know, it's not, not going to kill anybody. I mean, I watch YouTube to do all sorts of cooking at a minute, and so far it's all working out great. But one day it may not, but I won't tell anybody. I'm just talking about the good things that happen. But usually it takes time to do anything. And to be transformed takes time, energy. And, you know, it takes effort on your behalf. It doesn't happen instantly. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says this, Above all else, guard your heart. For everything flows from it. The way to start being transformed is to guard your heart. Stop taking rubbish in. Stop taking being conforming to the patterns of this world. Stop allowing it to get into your system. You know, it's not wrong going to a party. But if you know that party is only going in, go in one direction, why go? Many times we walked away from barbecues because we knew at this point people start to get drunk, it's time to go home. We don't want to be there. We don't want to go there. We, don't, we didn't conform. We were being transformed. Ephesians 6 verse 11 says this. It says, put on the full armour of God so that, when, so that you can take your stand against the evil schemes. So you need to guard your heart. You put on the full armour of God and take your stand against the devil. Don't allow him to show you what you can have. Jesus, when he was being tempted, it says the devil took him up to an eye mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. You can have these if you bow down and worship me. He should. He uses the same tactic that he used right from the beginning, right through to today. Watch what you're looking at and look, watch what you're seeing. In 1 Peter, sorry, 2 Peter 1 verse 3, it says this. Talking about God. His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glorious goodness. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. You don't need anything else. Where is it? It's called the Word of God. The Spirit of God living inside us. He's done everything. He's given us everything. We just need to renew our minds. 1 Peter, sorry, 1 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says this. Talking about renewing your mind. It's in all scripture. All the Bible is God breathed. And useful for several things. It says this. For useful for teaching you. For correct uh, what is true. And this is a different translation. That's why it's from it. I'll read you and I'll come back. It says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realise what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do, what is to do right. 
God is using it to prepare and equip people to do every good works. All scriptures God breathed and used for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in all righteousness. But not all the Bible is for all those four things. But the Bible covers all those four things. So we can't use the Bible as a weapon, but we can use the Bible to teach ourselves and to be transformed by renewing of our minds. You see, you need to either read the Word of God and trust what the Word of God says, or do what everybody else tells you. I mean, there's always somebody got something to say about faith, something, haven't there? You know, so what's happening in your life will tell you everything. I mean, I said to Steve, um, I was talking to him the other week, just trying to just sat talking and blessing him and just trying to encourage him, tell him about what the Bible says. And we were having a good chat about things. And he's on his journey and he knows where he's going and he's happy about things. But that takes a renewing of the mind because there's other people who don't know where they're going to go when they die and they're petrified. And we can tell them there is hope beyond the grave. Therefore, the, oh, sorry. so we need to, every, by renewing our mind, it's so that we can be prepared to equip, it can equip us to do every good works. Back to verse 1 of Romans 12. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. So when someone says to me, Johnny, I don't know what God's will is for my life, back up a little bit. If you don't know what God's will is for your life, back up a little bit. Have a look at it. Now don't get, don't get stressed out about it because probably 90% of you are walking in God's will. You're just not aware of it because God's great, awesome, amazing. And he, he narrows your options. He kind of gives you A or nothing sometimes. So you can take A or take nothing. So he only gives you an option sometimes. He doesn't do that often, but sometimes he narrows it down. But for you guys, you've got to understand that for you guys watching online, that probably you're walking in God's will, or at least part of God's will, and we'll get into that. People often say to me, you know, God's told me this, or I know that it's God's will. And I sometimes look at them going, I'm not sure. Because I know what the Bible says. Now I've had people say, this is a true story. I had somebody come up to me and say, Johnny, you know, will you pray for me that I get an husband? <coughs> So uh, there's a few of us, so yeah, we'll pray for you that you get an husband. A week later, she said, God's answered my prayers. I found a guy and he's going to be my husband. That goes, oh, great. So I went, uh, so went just inside, went, just mm, inside. So I went, where did you meet him? She goes, in a nightclub. Now, I, I didn't know this at the time, but sometimes God uses me, and you know what I'm like, I'm quite blunt. So she said to me, I've been praying for a husband, God's give me, uh, God give me somebody who's going to be my husband. I met him in a nightclub and I said, yeah, but you didn't have to bring him home and sleep with him. She goes, yeah, but if it's going to be my husband, it's all right. I goes, no, the Bible's clear about certain stuff. So that, she's saying, God's answered the prayer, it's God's will, it's God's will, I know it's God's will. Well, months later, she's not walking with God and he obviously wasn't a Christian. Trashed her life up. Which ended up getting to all sorts of uh, drugs and stuff like that. Just totally trashed the life up. I've known the other side of it where people said to me, Johnny, Johnny, pray with me. I, oh, I've been praying for a pay rise at work. I'm praying for a pay rise. And then the boss comes along and says, you know, if you work Sundays, you'll get more money. Great, that's the answer to prayer. That's not a pay rise. That's doing more hours. You see, I work Sundays, which uh, is part of the job. But I wouldn't work Sundays if I didn't do this job. I was self-employed for years as a builder and let me tell you, weekends is a great time to make a heck of a lot of money, but I honour Jesus first. Church has never been an option to us, it's been this is what we do. This is what we do, regardless of whether I work for church or not, it's, it's irrelevant. But I know lots of people who compromise, that's conforming to the pattern of this world. But when it comes to the will of God, I reckon it's that most of us know when we start stepping off the path that God's got for us. If you're walking in peace and you know that God's blessing you and you're comfortable in the situation you've got and you know you're moving forward in things, you're probably in the will of God. But if it's turmoil, if, if inside you know... Now, it doesn't mean you're not in a storm. You can be in a storm, but no, you're still in the will of God because every one of us has got this little thing in our heart that goes, no. 
and it shouts loud but sometimes we shout louder because we don't want to listen because we like what we're getting into and we know that God will forgive us and we know it's going to be good but as believers we tend to know when we are coming off the path of life we know it about the Holy Spirit inside us so then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is and this is the important thing it's good, it's pleasing and it's perfect will so I said that probably 90% of you guys are walking in the will of God. Why? Because the good will of God is this. It's about in 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not willing that any perish, but for all to come to repentance. Or in another verse, it says that it's not God's will that any should perish. So when somebody gets saved, they're in God's will. It's good will. So if you're saved this morning, guess what? You're in God's will. So that's why I don't overcomplicate it. I'm already in God's will because I'm already saved. However, that's God's good will. Now there's his pleasing will and his perfect will. And it gets a little bit more interesting. So part of his good will is, it says this, 1 Timothy 2, 4, it says, Who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth? That's talking about God. Part of God's good will is that he wants to bless people. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, For the Lord God is sun and shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk is, whose walk is blameless. You see, God's good will is for him to bless those people whose walk is blameless. But he wants us to step out of just his good will and walk in his pleasing will. Taking it up a step. His pleasing will is more about what you're doing with your life. And in Hebrews 11, uh, 6, it says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anybody who comes to it must believe he exists. Yes, we've done that because we've got saved. And that is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Those who earnestly seek him are those people who's laying down their life, making Jesus their Lord, and are being transformed by the renewing of their minds. It's journeying, all these things are connected together. In Romans 14, 18 it says, Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. So there's a pleasing will of God. When you're doing what God's, when you're honouring God and obeying God, when you're just living the Christian life, I'm not talking about doing ministry, changing the world or anything like that. If you're just doing... The, the things that you've been laid on your heart, so the job that majority of you guys do is the will of God. I did not know that. Well, the Bible says that you should serve your earthly masters, your employer, like serving Jesus, which is awkward if you don't like him. That's a study, that's Colossians. But we need just to, to walk in the pleasing will of God. A majority of people have got saved and you're walking in the good will of God. And now you're walking in the you're pleasing or by the pleasing will of God because you're steadily getting your mind transformed. But then there's the perfect will of God. Those people are walking the bullseye of what God's got for them. And this is to be to walk in the perfect will of God is really to become like Jesus. And for, for many people that won't happen till the moment they go into glory when they see him. But we need to be transformed. The word transform or the renewing of our mind is a continuously doing it. It's not just a one-off, right, I'm going to be transformed. And I'm going to renew my mind. There it is. No, it's a continuous throughout our lives, being transformed little by little, a bit more and a bit more, and being not conforming, but then changed to be more like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this. So all of us who have had the, that veil removed, in other words, but those who've got saved, we've had the veil of blindness removed, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious peer, um, image. Every day, if you get up and you're just thankful to God, if you're just continuously walking with God, you become more like Him. By the way, there's some versions of this where it says going from glory to glory. And people often say that we're going from glory to glory to glory. To... No, no, we're not going from glory to glory to glory to glory. We're going from one glory, which is an earthly glory, 
to another glory which is an eternal heavenly glory and we transition in between them we're moving from one glory which is our earthly level to a spiritual level and we're becoming more like Jesus Hebrews 12 verse 1 and 2 says this therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses since you're surrounded by such a great awesome bunch of people no okay since you've got people with you he says let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily it so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us and do nothing sorry we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus the champion uh, of our and perfecter of our faith because of the joy awaiting him he endured the cross um, despising its shame and now is set, seated at the place of honour beside God's throne we fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter or the pioneer and perfecter of our faith the way you get transformed is to keep Jesus in mind how do you keep Jesus in mind you keep in the word of God you keep in prayer you keep in generally keep him in your mind you know the Bible says that we should pray continuously it's an interesting one isn't it you try praying when you're typing something up you try you try praying when you're just about to let somebody know what's really on your mind but it's not saying that we need to kneel down and pray oh Jesus it means we should be constantly keeping them in our thoughts before you let somebody know what you're really thinking Jesus is this right and he might say yeah tell him no <laughs> who knows is this right should I do this it's just oh, for me I love just driving around I love hiking I love walking around. and I'm just so thankful for what he's done what I see I'm getting a very much an awareness for um, dandelions which I know most people hate because they are such a great thing if you know about anything to do with dandelion roots and leaves and you know grannies used to use them for all sorts and not just making pop out of them they're a great source but the world wants us to use pharmaceutical products when God goes I've given you a lot of natural products and we'll leave that there because you could go into some cul-de-sacs with that one so so we may not be transformed in a moment but one day we will be but let me tell you this you don't have to be transformed instantly it'll never happen but what you can do you can't look at me going well you I'll never get there but you will you take baby steps just little steps day by day little by little you don't have to conquer a mountain in one jump you just take a step and then you choose to take another step you see the way you overcome fear is not to run away from it and it's not really to sit in counseling for month after month it's to face up to your fears with good friends around you face up to it there's no point trying to jump a river that's meters wide but when you're not a long jump but learn where the bridges are little steps just little steps day by day little by little moving forward you see nobody's transformed instantly now, I wish we were it made my job a lot easier and it'd have been a lot better for me you've got to go just download it into your head learn the Bible in 24 seconds it'd have been amazing but I took years of reading and studying it and reading and I'm still learning so much about it it's little set you know praise and worship it's not my you know it's not my greatest gift I have a go I've got a tickle of throat as well but I have a go but little steps you know becoming a great person happens by taking little steps you are not the person you are today because you took one jump you came out of your mother's womb and went I'm here in fact for the first six months you probably just cried and smiled and pooped and all those other things it took time it took education but then we take on a lot of negative stuff and we need to get rid of the negative, negative stuff and we need to take on the transformation of the word of God into our lives and little steps you could be everyone here could be awesome amazing if you take the steps I had a thing with my knee recently um, and what the doctor said well the only thing you could do for your knee is operate 
Me, I'm thinking I don't like the idea of operations, so I prayed about it. And then I'm looking up on, on YouTube about a hiker who had a problem with knee. So I'm praying for me. And this guy says, you don't have to have all this rubbish um, operations. He said, just stretch out. So I started stretching out. Praying about things, stretching out. And I stand at the bottom of the stairs on my car, so I'm stretching them out while I'm talking to God. So I'm praying at the same time, stretching my car, and then my legs are here, and it's this big, fat, muscly thing in me bum cheek, it needs some real pounding and it hurts if you eat it. But over time, the pain's gone. Was it a miracle? You know what, I've been praying about it. Was it the stretching? I'll tell you something, I feel better for stretching out and praying than letting somebody stab me with a knife in the kneecap. Your choice, by the way, I'm not saying this so you do this sort of thing. All I'm saying is that it's little by little. The problem is that most people want the tablet of quick fixes where I'm going with it. But I need it. It took, it took me about, I pulled my calf tendon at Christmas. Now I can run. Because I've had to stretch it out, stretch. It took months. Stretching out anything takes months. Do you know what? They reckon that if you actually work on it and stretch out, you can be as flexible as you were when you were about five. No, I don't want to go that far back, 16 maybe. You know, where I could jump over the gates. But I watched a video of a, of a lady who was in her 80s, 80s, doing gymnastics across the floor. Most people say when you get to a 60s, you can't even touch your toes. But she would, why? Because she stretches out. So I'm telling you, everything takes energy, effort, and it takes time. So your walk with God takes time, but it takes effort. See, if the doctor says to you, take these tablets three times a day for six months, you will probably take the tablet six, three times a day for six months. Whether you saw anything or not, doctors told me so, I'll do it. If I tell you to read three verses in the morning, three verses at dinner time, and three verses at tea time, you go, I ain't got time. Because we don't appreciate the value of doing the little thing when it comes to God. Yet we want the big strides and God's not in the habit of giving us big strides, he said just take the little ones. Psalm 119, 105, he says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, which means it's going to illuminate what's in front of you. What's in front of you? Except for what's in front of you. So don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't get squeezed into what it says and what's good. Now, for some people, they learn by mistakes. Some people learn by other people's mistakes. Learn fast. You don't have to make the mistake. Just watch somebody else make the mistake and learn by it. But let your mind be transformed through and renewed by the Word of God. And take baby steps every day. None of us got here in a week. Some of you have been on this journey for a long time and he's still growing. Some people, some people are growing up still, the kids in the back, and it's still up, it shouldn't grow too much higher, like a dad. But we, we grow physically, but spiritually you grow as well. Through the transformation of the Word of God in your life and the renewing of your mind. So, let your life be a, a living sacrifice for God. And then from there, not allowing the world to crush you and push you and to change you, you'll be transformed into the likeness of Jesus through the renewing of your mind. And it's all about taking baby steps, day by day, little by little. Amen. 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 Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. Thank you, Lord, that if we're saved, we're in your will. Lord, if we're walking in obedience to you, Lord, we're in your pleasing will. Lord, and for all of us, one day we'll be in your perfect will. Help us, Lord, to be transformed and to be renewed through your word, through prayer, by your spirit, and through fellowship with one another. Help us, Lord, to serve you daily, just trusting in you. In the name of Jesus, amen.